Today being Palm Sunday, there's so much connected with this. So let's pick up the reading in John chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, if not, it'll be on the screen behind me. The Bible says the next day a great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion, see your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At the first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Every time I get to this time of year, I, I love, in my home, when I was growing up, <clears throat> Mom and Dad made this time of year extra special. We, we did Easter baskets and things like that, but there was always, really, in our home prayer times, there was always this focus of the fact that Jesus rode in on a donkey, and he is highly praised. People are, you know, they're singing these great songs of, of salvation, and, and oftentimes on this Sunday, we didn't sing it this year, but we sing Hosanna, you know, we celebrate that. Um, and, but Hosanna, the words, Hosanna means, oh, save us. And so here we have this, this, this crowd here that's, that's coming into this, uh, Jesus coming into the city, and this crowd is thronging around him. And this is five days before Jesus is going to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem with his disciples. So it's a pretty cool picture here of Jesus coming in and being worshipped and adored and honored and, and more pointed uh, about this uh, time of adoration and celebration about Jesus is that this same crowd, many of them, just not many days later, are going to be shouting, crucify him. And so we have kind of an oxymoron with their, um, with their whole attitude and their character about what they're, who they're going to believe in. And so if we back up a little bit in John chapter 12 to verse 9, I want to read uh, verse number 9. In fact, the, the Bible tells us that the chief priests were already making plans to kill him and Lazarus as well, because as you know, Jesus rose Lazarus from the grave. In verse 9 it says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. I would suppose so. If one of our number here today had died and, and we went to the graveside funeral and we're standing there and Jesus showed up and said, come out of the grave, I imagine that this church would be not only full, it would be over full. People would hear about it and the news would get out and this would be an amazing thing, right? So here we have this huge crowd of people, a bunch of Jews that are coming and following Christ, taking away the business, if you will, of those who were Jewish leaders in the synagogue and uh, Jewish tradition and religious Jews. And what they're doing is they're angry and they're upset at Jesus for taking away the attention that they've been getting. Uh, they plotted to kill Jesus even before he came into Jerusalem. And, you know, it's pretty amazing to see how the strategy and voice of these really satanically inspired leaders can turn the crowd so quickly. And they're only really just part of the, of the fulfillment, though, that was happening to Jesus. The reason that he died is for us. Uh, we, can get in, we can talk about the, the, the view from on top of the palace and what must have been happening in the soldiers' eyes as they look at this massive crowd gathering and the stirring. The, the Bible says the whole city was stirred as Jesus comes into town. We can talk about the antics of how they acted and, and the donkey he was riding on. But the reason that Jesus came into Jerusalem to give his life was for you and I. He did that because of us. Jesus died, quite frankly, because of our unrighteousness. I want to read a lengthy portion of scripture, again, paraphrase the message from the message today in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, all the way down through verse 21. Follow me if you can. Our firm decision is to work from this focused center. One man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his life, a resurrected life, a far better life than people had ever lived on their own. Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people, uh, excuse me, we don't ev uh, evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We look at the Messiah that way once, and we got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now, we look inside, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone. A new life virgins. Look at it. 
all comes, all this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the word square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he was doing. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into the work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already friends with you. How, you say, in Christ, God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so that we could be put right with God. But I like the way the NIV puts that. God made him who had no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Now, I'm sure you've heard people talk about the word righteous a lot. Righteous dude used to be a statement, remember? Righteous dude. I mean, some uh, crazy people came up with that, I think. I think I've said it myself before. But in the context of this kind of righteousness, that is really nothing to compare. In 2 Corinthians here, Paul really hits home this idea that there was nothing good about us at all, but it is the righteousness of God that has made us complete. Jesus died because of our unrighteousness, because of our sin, so that we could become, become the righteousness of God. There's this idea of becoming as a Christian, and I'm so glad, because I look at my life even this last week, and there are a lot of places, man, I, I really want to be becoming. I want to be growing. I need to be straightening up myself more and more assertive to the things that God wants for me to be and to do in my life. And so those ideas are very important. God is righteous, and we are not. Job asked one of the greatest questions of the Bible. In Job chapter 9 and verse 2, and he says, How can a mortal man be righteous before God? How can it, even this wise man Job comes up with this profound statement. Indeed, the Bible you know, repeatedly teaches that God is righteous you know, over and over again. Isaiah, uh, Ezra 9, 15, Psalm 41, 11, 7, Isaiah 56, 45, Daniel 9, 4. Throughout the Bible, I've got a whole list of them here. It says that, that God is righteous. And by righteous, Scripture means straight. It means right. It means sinless. So to put the un before righteous is what categorizes, categorizes us. We look at God, he is righteous and pure and holy. We are unrighteous. In fact, we're contrary-wise. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.21 is so important. God made him who had no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Adam's sin, as you know, brought the curse on all mankind. The Bible teaches that God made humanity in a state of sinless righteousness. Genesis chapter 1 and Ecclesiastes 7 both say this, but man fell into a continual state of unrighteousness because of disobedience, because of a beginning with our father Adam, all the way from Genesis chapter 3 and on. Adam was our representative, the head of the physical father, and his sin has been imputed to all of us. I think the, the simpleness of the gospel relays that. We know that we're sinners, we know that we're lost, but the idea of being associated with unrighteousness kind of takes it all to a whole new level. Because if God alone is righteous, and he is good, and he is holy, and perfect in every way, then to be opposite of that is to be entirely not that. If God didn't all of a sudden stand back one day on a dartboard and a whole bunch of bad stuff, throw darts and walk up, oh, there's ten things on this dartboard that I don't like, so I'm going to make them sin. No, God is holy and righteous already, so everything opposite of him is unrighteous. The Bible tells us quite clearly that it, by imputation here in Romans, I didn't read it, but it talks about the fact that, that that was given over to Jesus. He took charge of our sin. He took charge. So consequently, everyone that's conceived with an unrighteous sin, we're all conceived with an unrighteous sin nature because of our first physical father, Adam. Psalm 51, 5 reiterates, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Psalm 58.3 also says the same thing. And, and subsequently, a life marked by personal sin is, is what comes out of that, that we're not living in God's righteousness. And the state of unrighteousness is opposite of God's perfect nature and is marked by crookedness and the wrong way and the wrong path. I've been uh, on several road trips. How many like road trips? And when you go on a road trip, you know, before GPS, I don't even know how I survived. We had these things called maps, and we pulled them out, and we looked at where we were going. 
and we hope that we got there. You know, it's like, okay, this road goes, and you're, if you're on a long road trip, it gets really easy until you get in the city, and then you've got to pull out, how many had Thompson guides? You know, oh my goodness, I live by the Thompson guides. I had one for Pierce, South Pierce County, and South King County, and, Pierce, and North Pierce, and I had all these Thompson guides, right? And you, you had to find, and now you just tell Garmin, I want to go to 4502 North Fawcett Street, downtown Tacoma, or whatever, and it takes you right there. I mean, so, in fact, I don't even pay attention where I'm going anymore because I just follow Garmin blindly and just looking around at all the sites. You know, if my car could drive itself, plug it into Garmin, that's coming. That's coming. That's next. One thing that is so amazing about righteousness is that how much we try to be righteous. Have you ever noticed that? Because we know that God is holy, and, and we look at the Bible, and he says, I want you to do this and this and this, and I don't want you to do this and this. So we begin looking at all the things contextually in Scripture, and we begin to think to ourselves, well, if I just did all these things perfectly, I'll really have it together. And so what we do is we begin in our own strength, oftentimes we begin to uh, try to add these things to our life and try to add them to our character without ever realizing it comes first from a relationship with God. Trying to be righteous is more damaging than simply ignoring our spiritual condition. You might say, Pastor, why would you say that? Because trying to be righteous produces this thing called self-righteousness. You see, we think we're good enough. We think we've got it all together. And the fact of it is, we're not. And the power of the gospel is that God knows that. He knows that we're not good enough, that we're not righteous, that we're not pure enough, that we're not holy enough, we're not, you know, together enough. He understands that. That's why he becomes sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. You see, Jesus didn't, just didn't ride into Jerusalem that day on a donkey like he did just because he did that because of our unrighteousness, our crookedness. And religiosity springs from that, that self-righteous attitude. In fact, the Bible says when we try to do that, it's like filthy rags compared to God's righteousness, and the connotation there in Scripture is a, literally a minstrel cloth given as a precious gift. That God, that God looks at that and he says, you're, you're filthy in my sight, and, and your goodness is not ever good enough. And pride does some things. Number one, pride tries to be righteous. Romans chapter 10, verse 3, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. As we're going through our series in Revelation, we're kind of taking a break right now uh, for the advent of the Resurrection Sunday and all that, but um, the church in Revelation, he says, I know your deeds. You claim to be rich, but you're pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, he says. He say, I've got it all together. I, I'm doing all the religious things right. I'm, I look right on the outside. In fact, this was the problem with the rich man and Lazarus. As Jesus was telling the story of the rich man and Lazarus, it's presumed that if you were a little bit more well-to-do and you had things together, that you were blessed by God. And Lazarus must not have been because he was covered with boils and he died a horrible death. And here's this idea that God seems to be putting over and over and over again in Scripture, that no matter what it looks on the outside, it's not always what's happening on the inside. You see, we can look real good, can't we? I can come to church sometimes. I've been there, and I've come to church myself and preach when I didn't want to preach, or I've wore a plastic mask before. I admit I've been there. All of us have. We come in, we, we go home, or we're, we sub our toe on the dresser drawer, we yell at our wife because the eggs were burned, and, and we get out the door, we hurry and drag our kids. Our kids are literally being dragged. Okay, I'm coming to church. I don't want to go, but I'll go. And they sit in the back row, and they fold their arms the whole time because they're so ticked off at mom and dad for dragging them to church. Come on, you've been there. Have you ever been a teenager before? Okay, I was just wondering. There was not much response. And we get to church, and we're yelling, and we cut, and we cut to the front door. And oh, hello, Pastor. God bless you. Great to see you today. God is so good for giving us this fresh rain from heaven. And we lay it on thick as though everything's A-OK. -okay. And righteousness is only something that can be done on the inside. You see, the seven sons of Siva learned this lesson. So we have this guy, he's got seven sons, I have four. I love having four boys. I know it would be like to have five or six or seven, but he's got seven. I can only handle four, I think. Or they can only handle me. Maybe it's the other way around. He's got seven sons, and in their righteousness, their own righteousness, because they think that they know how to do things, there's a demon-possessed man, 
And they come and they say, you know, and, G- and the one, the Jesus that Paul preaches, you know, we're going to cast this demon out. And the demon says to them, well, I know him and I know Jesus, but who are you guys? And he beats the seven of them up. The Bible says they leave naked and bleeding. That was some brawl. I mean, if I saw that going on, I'd just run out as quickly as I could. Apparently, probably some tried, but this one guy did that much damage. Why? Because they tried to be righteous. They were wearing a cloak of goodness when on the inside they were not entirely convinced that Jesus was Savior. Perhaps the most devoted people to pursuing self-righteousness were the Pharisees, and despite their great self-discipline, they did live a very moral life. They were heralded and held up high because they were so good. Jesus, de- Jesus really says, in fact, he declares that unless your righteousness supersedes theirs, you would end up in hell right along with them in Matthew 5.20. In other words, if you don't look as good as they look, if you don't look better than they look and behave better, than, because that was the standard of the day, that that was the Mother Teresa of the day. You have to act perfect just this way, because if your righteousness doesn't exceed the very best that humankind can do, you will never inherit the kingdom of God. You'll be in hell. Wow, that's an eye-opening statement, isn't it? And Jesus says it so plainly, it just rolls off of his tongue as though it's natural, because it is natural. He understands that being convinced and looking that way is different from being convinced on the inside. Pride says, I can do this myself, and no, man can, no one can tell me what is good because I already know what's good. We have a person we've been witnessing to our family, and, and she thinks she keeps coming back. Her statements are because I'm, I'm a good person and I do good things and, and all this, that, that I'm okay, and she'll push us off. Push. I'm sure you know people like that, right? You've been trying to plant seeds, and, and what we do is we keep loving her, we keep, uh, uh, we keep reaching out to her, we keep doing these things. And, and people think that, and the world's been disguised by this because maybe the church has sold it, that, that we look good on the outside, so we must be really good. And God says, wait a minute. Pride, that kind of pride transforms your thinking and, and makes the mind filled with self. Pride is reckless. Proverbs 16 and 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride is foolish. Proverbs eleven twelve 12 says, When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Pride is selfish. Pride is the centerpiece of all problems. Did you know that? Proverbs says, Pride is the source of all contention. All contention. That means if there's contention, there's pride somewhere. Pride is selfish. David Wilkerson wrote in America's Last Call, a powerful book about uh, keeping your heads up for holiness, basically. And he writes, When the Lord exposed people of Jerusalem to danger, they should have turned to him. Instead, they turned to their own resources, the strength of their armor. They told themselves, We have good, sturdy shields, and call, and the city wall is very strong. We have all the materials we need to fill all the breaches. We can fortify ourselves. Simply put, They said, I don't need God. I can survive on my own. Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible says over and over again, the psalmist says, my integrity will protect me. My integrity will guard me. My integrity will keep me from taking the wrong step. Our integrity is our responsibility. But true righteousness comes from other places. Comparing ourselves to others also tries to be righteous. I'm sure you've heard this. Well, at least I'm not like so-and-so. Luke chapter 18, um, um, verse 9, Jesus tells this, and he says, Two men who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, thank you that I'm not like other men. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. The gall of this guy, right? Verse 12, I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. He beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, rather than the other one, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. We know the parable well. I'm sure you've heard it. If you have been in church for any length of time at all, you've heard that being said 
a hundred different ways, certainly. But the principle of the thing that Jesus is trying to relay is that it's not what you're saying or looking like that makes you good. You have nothing to do with that. In fact, he goes on to say that the one who does this, comparing themselves by other people, they are not wise. They are not smart. He who compares himself by himself is not wise. That's quite a statement. Don't we do that a lot? Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. Oh, well, I look at that person. Man, the way they can pray. I hear them pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thou art good and worthy. They pray in King James, right? Um, I wish I could pray like that person. I wish I was like this, or I wish I was like that. Maybe we get the opposite true, or just like this tax collector, where we think that because everybody else is beneath us or worse than us, somehow that's enough righteousness to make it on our own. The funny thing about righteousness is, though, God requires righteousness of us. It's so important, I guess we better know what it means. Webster says righteous means doing what is right, just, upright, and godly. Paul equates the breastplate to righteousness, an interesting piece of the armor that protects the vital organs. We certainly can make the application that the breastplate protects the heart, and righteousness protects my relationship with Jesus and my character. It's been said many times that there's an ability for us to be righteous through maintaining good character, and I've heard it preached many times that righteousness is right living. How many ever heard that? Righteousness is right living. I'm sure you have. If you've been in church, there's people that wrote books uh, alluding to those ideas. And the problem with this definition is it is completely opposite from what the Bible says. For it is by grace we're saved through faith, that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. So our own works aren't good enough. I remember one time we were at Central Bible College, and there every year they have the missionary conference there. And the missionaries would come in uh, from all over the world that were available on their itineration schedules. And they did this every year. And every year we would set up for it, and all the missionaries would come. We'd have this great missions conference, and, and just like we do here every January, similar except on a much larger scale, you know, a couple thousand missionaries in this place in and, and, and Springfield, Missouri, God's holy anointed place for the assemblies of God. I still bow that way every morning when I pray. Uh, <laughs> no, but in spite of the assemblies of God, there's a lot of things on board the ship, but she's still floating. Um, it was a wonderful experience because from all over the world we had these people that come in and, and they, they share what God is doing in, through their ministry. Some were having a hard time. Those that come from Europe, they're having a hard time. The ground is rocky and hard. And, and some of those that are coming from South America, oh my goodness, it's like revival is busting out and we just wanted to touch, be close. You have ever heard communicators like that? You just wanted to be close to them. You wanted to hear, they wanted to talk. You just, man, if I could just touch you for a second, I might, some of it might rub off. And listening to them over and over again tell their stories. And, and one of the guys that was uh, telling their story was, was uh, from Indonesia. And he was relaying the fact that, that they were on this little boat going from one island to the other. And, and they didn't know what was going to happen because some guys had gotten aboard the boat that were a little nefarious looking. And they started taking over. And, and they, were gonna, they started shooting people that were on the boat. And this one woman who didn't know what else to do, they came to her and they were going to um, do something to her. And... And she fell on her knees, and she began to pray for them and call on the name of the Lord. And they left her alone. They got off the boat. They laid down their guns. And I hear stories like this, and I'm going, God, I want to see these things in America. I want to see President Obama fall on his knees before you and say, God, we need to return to you again. I, that's the kind of stuff that I want to see. And I began to recognize something about what he was saying in his story as he was telling the story. He said, you know, oftentimes we come to church, and what we do is we, we, we kind of act like God is really moving, when in our lives we know less of that experience. We have not had the impact of God really in our life, of a, of a life living, following him, expecting, anticipating his power and his presence to really be there. And so we come to church oftentimes putting on the face of God that he is really here when oftentimes he is not. You know, friends, do you come to church anticipating, expecting? Do you live your life every day waking up anticipating what great things that God will do? Are you working in your own strength? You know, Paul says in Romans chapter 9, verse 30, What shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, who pursued the law of righteousness, has not attained it? Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, 
but as if it were by works. The stumbled over the stumbling stone. You know, there is a place where it's really cautious and careful that we watch that the living that we're living is coming from the inside. And you've heard me say a thousand different ways, if you listen to what comes out your mouth all week, it'll tell you what your heart's like. Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, and sometimes we talk so depressed, we talk so angry, maybe foulness comes out of our mouth. These are just outward, visible indicators of a lack of the presence of God in our lives. Don't forget, there's more fingers pointing at me than there is you. Galatians 2.16, so beautiful. A lot of scripture this morning, I know. Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by observing the law, because by, observance, by observing the law, no one will be justified. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ pronounced sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I'm a lawbreaker. For though the law, for through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness can be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Now that word law in there is in there a lot. And let me just kind of explain because maybe some don't get it. The law was uh, the, the rules and regulations that oftentimes were taught by men. And, and uh, many of the laws were introduced by God himself to the people to live a life that was pure of, of things that would hurt them. He didn't want them to eat crawling fish from the bottom like we do. He, he told them not to eat meats that had the fat marbled into it like we do today because of grace. We understand the illustration there. But he said a lot of things to them about what to do, what not to do, those groups that were not to have tattoos, but yet those groups that could. Just don't get a tattoo. You'll be ashamed of years later, and especially when the sin starts, skin starts to sag. It may not be as appealing as it once was. I don't know why I am. Hello? Hello? Um, but he was, he was saying the law, all the rules, all the things, the do's and don'ts, all these things that you do, you're not supposed to do, all the do's and don'ts, he says those are the law, that's the law. He said if perfectness or righteousness or salvation could be earned by keeping those rules, then hey, the Jews got it made. But he said it doesn't. He said it doesn't. Righteousness better termed is right standing before God. So if righteousness is not truly right living, it is right standing. And in light of these scriptures, we can truly define righteousness as standing before God in his presence, knowing that we are covered with the blood of his son. That's why I love that song we sang earlier this morning, Boldly I Approach Your Throne. What other person could boldly approach a throne except the son or daughter of the father? What is it like when your son or daughter runs up to you and they need your help or they need your aid? As they get older, if they run up to you, they might knock you down. My boys do. They're so big now. But when they're little, they run up to you and you, you open your arms and you embrace them. Even if they've been in sin, even if they've done something wrong and need to be corrected, you still embrace them. You still love them as a loving father would do in bringing the absolute necess necessity of correction. But our loving father does the same thing. He, he applies the the, the blood of, of his son applied to our life. And so he looks at us through these eyes of grace. 2 Corinthians 1.22 puts it this way, that he set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Are you experiencing that deposit of his spirit, friends? Does your spirit rejoice when you worship? Are you made alive when you read his word? Do you come alive when you hear about the good things of God? Is the Spirit of God dwelling in you? Is he living in you? True righteousness is based on a genuine relationship with Jesus, of course. It's true that I can do a lot of things on my life to gain some protection in this life, and righteousness, the Bible says, does protect us, but the covering of Christ's righteousness is complete. The illustration of the breastplate is, again, uh, uh, communicates that offensive weapons are trying to penetrate my life. They're trying to, to hurt me. They're trying to take 
charge of the, the things in my life that, that caused me to tick and hurt my heart. There are so many connotations of righteousness in Scripture. It's too exhaustive for, for this short sermon this morning. But if, in, if you study Scriptures, it says that we are clothed in righteousness. We stand before God in His righteousness. We're conquerors through righteousness. Righteousness leads and guides our steps. Righteousness seats us in heavenly places. Righteousness exalts station, nations and destroys enemies. Through righteousness, the Bible says we are more than conquerors. But a righteous man's home is protected and a woman's work through righteousness is blessed. Through righteousness, children are blessed and righteousness pr uh, produces a rich reward. Righteousness delivers from death, produces peace and genuine love. Righteousness looks down on the earth and blesses it with fruit, the Bible says. Your name is known because of righteousness. When the world falls, righteousness keeps you standing, Scripture says. Judgment and peace come through righteousness. Righteousness formed the earth. Righteousness produces justice, and poor men are made rich because of righteousness. Righteousness upholds the oppressed and cures the depressed. Righteousness gives more pleasure and contentment than riches. The Bible says righteousness redeems us. There's a lot of things righteousness does. That's quite a list of stuff. When you look at the Bible and you just pull those little tidbits out like I did, you can take any Strong's or, or Bible uh, concordance on your computer and it'll explode with the things that, can, that righteousness does. And it's a beautiful thought. So we must have it. And it can't be earned on our own. Friends, oftentimes we say and we equate character with righteousness, but the righteousness that God requires is a righteousness that only He can pay for. Now, I believe God's righteousness, of course, will produce good character. There's so many associations to be made with righteousness and how it produces character because it first comes from a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfills all the requirements righteously of the law. Compassionate toward us, our eternal God, Jesus became man because Jesus did not have an earthly father. He, he was not a father descended from Adam like we are. So we have that sin nature. We have that that desire to be unrighteous, even putting on the mask, if you will, and, and looking right on the outside, and God's calling for a people. You can imagine what, what would happen if God's people in his churches all across the city here in Lakeland, South Tacoma, if we would get energized with the, with the Spirit of God on the inside and be letting that out. That would be a different kind of church. It would not be a religious one. It would be a righteous one. Righteous, dude. Unlike the first Adam who sinned, Jesus lived a righteous perfection. Romans 5.12, he resisted temptation to sin. He fulfilled all of God's laws. He fulfilled all righteousness. I think there's one more thing, too. He died as the only righteous man who has ever lived. The only righteous man who's ever lived. Get that in your head. Can you wrap your brain around that? That all of us are unrighteous. No, not one, the Bible says, for we've all sinned, Romans 3, 20, and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous, but the only one who was died. He gave his life for us. I think as we look at Jesus riding into the city, he's not just riding in just uh, because it's a good thing to do, just to be adored and worshipped in that moment. Man, he's coming in because he was going to die for unrighteousness. In his death, the righteous Jesus stood in the place of sinners, paying for our sin, which is death. So the people who are righteous in God's sight are made so because of Jesus. So the answer to Job's question is that an unrighteous person can stand before righteous God, not by our own work, but solely by trusting in the person and work by faith that is in Jesus. Jesus alone is our righteousness. The Bible says he makes us righteous people, Ephesians 4, and enables us to pursue righteousness, to obey scripture by the power of his Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad today, friends, that you live in this New Testament time? When I think about the fact that Jesus came, he rode into the city, and a few short days later, he gave his life on a cruel cross for us, and gave his life so that we could know life, dying for our unrighteousness, just because that we are privy to that information today makes us a different kind of breed than those who lived under the Old Covenant. 
You know, those that lived under the old covenant may have understood righteousness and the respect that God was holy and righteous, and they approached him. In fact, the Israelites were so terrified of God, they didn't want to talk to him. They said, Moses, you went up in the mountain, you came down, it was shaking, there was thunder, your head's glowing, it's freaking me out, right? So he says, Moses, you go up the mountain, you talk to God, we'll sit back here, you just kind of tell us what he says. So God was terrified. God's righteousness was, was something not to be looked at. And, and, and the, the Bible tells us that for us today, our sins are separated because of the cross. But if you were to ask David in the Old Testament, he would say our sins are as far as the east is from the west. Now that's pretty good for an Old Testament king, but that means that our sins are still out there. Our unrighteousness is still out there. Well, David's just a shepherd boy, so let's ask a prophet, Hosea. Hosea, what about our righteousness? What about God's righteousness? What about our sins? He would say they're in a deep sea in the hole. They're in a deep hole in the sea. That's great, but they're still out there. So let's move up away from Hosea to the big leagues, the major prophet. Let's talk to Isaiah. Isaiah, what about our sins? What about our unrighteousness? The Bible says that Isaiah would say they are behind his back. Well, that's good but they're still out there. So let's move away from Isaiah, and let's ask a few other people in the Old Testament where God would place their sin or their unrighteousness. They would say that it was a, every uh, a year an annual sacrifice that they would bring, but that never took away sins. Friends, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and Hebrews chapter 10 that Jesus died for our unrighteousness, and he was the one and only spotless Lamb of God. And because he became sin for us, we through him, have the rightness to become the righteousness of God. We have rights as, as children to that righteousness. And I'm so grateful for that today. I like that 1 John 3, 1, because it's got a sloppy word in it. I think it's sloppy, and I'll explain what I mean by sloppy. How great is the love the Father has lavished. Lavished. Doesn't that sound like hugging someone and kissing them all over and I don't know. That's just Larry's corny mind. We could go to the, to the Greek here, but we're not going to, because that's Larry's translation. If Eugene Patterson can do it, I can do it. Lavished on us. Praise God that we should be called children of God, and that this is what we know. The reason the world does not know him is that uh, does not know us is that it did not know him. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. <coughs> Jesus died for our unrighteousness. And I'm so grateful for that, this resurrection season, to celebrate that. <coughs> Excuse me. And to know that it is through him that we have that privilege. Now, let me just end, before we pray here, dismiss this morning, by saying I think that many times in our life we encounter problems and circumstances and we begin to think of the cross of Christ and say, God, I realize the big picture, but what about me right now? What about all that's going on in my life today? I'm, I'm having trouble at work. I'm having situations here and there. You know, God, friends, i got to say, God, Jesus died just as much for the unrighteous things that are going on here in the very moment that you live than he did in the big picture scheme of things. And that he loves you so much. And I'm so glad that he loves me in spite of myself. That he, he looks at my whole life and he understands what I need. We need him so much. When he rode into Jerusalem that day, he was coming intentionally. He was coming on purpose. He knew what, the Bible says he knew what was ahead. The cross was before him. And I'm so glad that he came and gave his life so that we could live life for eternity and for right here. A life filled with his joy and make us complete. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Stand with me, would you? Ask our musicians to come. We'll sing one more song here together in closing. Lord Jesus, I love you so much. I praise you for this church service this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your grace today and our worship time. I praise you, Lord, even for tonight and the fellowship we're going to have. We always have so much fun at these things. I praise you for the church family. But God, more intimately and securely this morning, we just say we want to praise you that you died for our unrighteousness. That when you were riding, you rode into the city on purpose, intentionally knowing what you would give so that we would have life.
and I praise you for that. I just ask God today that your Holy Spirit would communicate to each one of our hearts in this building that we have a responsibility to, res to respond to your righteous call. That you have planned for righteousness in every one of us, Lord, and maybe some of us are living far from there. So we give that to you right now. I want to ask you, friend, in this place, as you've been here,